Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webinar. I would like to remind you that this conference is being recorded. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those connected by telephone requiring operator assistance during the call, please press star zero. Web participants requiring support should use the chat feature on your screen. I would now like to turn the meeting over to your moderator, Mr. Stephen Samus, Vice President of Programs at Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement. Please go ahead, Mr. Samus. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to today's on-call webinar entitled Harkness and Healthcare, Canadian Harkness Fellowship 2017-18. As you heard, I'm Stephen Samus, Vice President of Programs here at CFHI, and I'm pleased to be your host for today's webinar. I'd ask you to please take a moment to introduce yourselves in the chat box. And as well, let us know how many people are attending from your location using the poll on your screen. So please enter the number, including yourself, the number of people who are with you today watching this webinar, including yourself. And as you do that, I will introduce our guest speakers. We're really pleased to have joining us today uh, two great speakers, Robin Osborne, Vice President and Director of the Commonwealth Fund's International Health Policy and Practice Innovations Program. In her current role, Robin is responsible for the Harkness Fellowships in Healthcare Policy and Practice, the Commonwealth Fund's annual international symposium on health policy, annual international health policy surveys of 11 countries, and ongoing comparisons of health systems data. As well, we have Dr. Al Cohen, Associate Scientist at SickKids Research Institute in Toronto. Dr. Cohen completed his medical training at the University of Toronto in 2000. He trained in pediatrics at the Hospital for Sick Children and the Children's Hospital at Westmead in Sydney, Australia. And in 2015-16, he was the Commonwealth Fund Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement Harkness Fellow in Healthcare Policy and Practice, and he was based at Stanford University for his fellowship. We also have our producers, Sheena Powell and Kelly Ripley, operating behind the scenes in Ottawa, and we're thrilled to have more than 30 people registered for today's session. So welcome to all of you. Just a few housekeeping items to cover before we begin the presentation. Simultaneous interpretation is provided for all CFHI on-call webinars, so please note that it may take a few short pauses in the dialogue today. It may make for a few short pauses, and we invite you to use either official language when entering your questions and comments into the chat box. To ensure that we get the most out of our time together, the screen has been split so that you can see both the French and English presentations. However, do note that there may be a slight delay in advancing the French slides due to the simultaneous interpretation. If at any time you wish to enlarge either presentation, simply click on the four diagonal arrows at the top right of the presentation to get the full screen mode. Please note that if you enlarge the presentation to the full screen, the chat box will be covered temporarily. You can return to the original screen and the chat by again pressing those four direct uh, diagonal arrows again. Throughout today's session, we're hoping that you will learn, first of all, how CFHI is bringing a Canadian perspective to the Harkness Fellowship Program, the benefits of a Canadian Harkness Fellowship in furthering your career, and what you can do to prepare and apply for the 2017-2018 Harkness Fellowship Program. Just before we get started, I'd like to just, uh, for those of you who are new to us, just to remind you a little bit about the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement and what we do. Uh, the CFHI really has um, uh, an aim to accelerate healthcare improvement across the country. Uh, and we really are aiming to improve the patient and family experience of care, to improve the health of populations and health outcomes, and to help Canadians get better value for money in healthcare spending. Our priorities are to build improvement capacity across the country and to provide on-the-ground support to spread and scale proven innovations in care. And we do that really in four fundamental ways by building leadership skill and capacity, and certainly the Harkness Fellowship Program is part of that uh, skills and capacity development uh, approach that we take, by applying improvement methods and tools and coaching to the work that we do, to enable patient and family engagement and to include patients and family members in the co-design of care, and we also create collaboratives to spread evidence-informed improvement across the country. So a little bit of information about the Canadian Harkness Fellowships. Uh, we have had over the years, since 2001, the 27 Canadian Harkness Fellows. 
And importantly, since 2012, we've now had six full-time Canadian Harkness Fellows. Prior to 2012, the Canadian Fellows were not full-time residents in the U.S. That changed in 2012, and six Canadians have now had the opportunity, along with fellows from the other 10 countries, to basically have a, um, to be, to be uh, in, resident in the United States for the entire year. As we talk about this Canadian Harkness Fellowship, the 2017-2018, we just want to remind those of you on the line about some of the key health and healthcare priorities that are priorities both of the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement and the Commonwealth Fund, as well as priorities that have been identified through the ongoing health accord discussions that are underway between the provinces, territories, and the federal government. And those priorities are to improve the health of in, and health care for Indigenous people in Canada. We have a real focus on health care innovation, both on the electronic side of e-innovation, but also on the improvement side of spreading innovative work across the country. Uh, home care and palliative care are national priorities across the country right now. We are all focused on high-need, high-cost patients and how we can uh, provide better care for those patients, and also how we can uh, meet some of the unmet needs, social as well as health care needs of those patients, uh, so that we can help them to avoid being high need, high cost patients on uh, high intensity health care services. And also pharmacare and pharmaceutical policy that improves access to necessary prescription medications. Those are the main priorities that we're looking at this year. And so, uh, while we encourage uh, applications from prospective fellows on a variety of topics, we are particularly interested in receiving applications that address those particular um, priorities this year. Uh, the Canadian so with that, um, and I guess one last thing would just be is the timetable for applications to the fellowship. So just a reminder of some very key dates. Today is October 6th. We're doing the webinar. Um, but the deadline for applications to be considered for the 2017-2018 Harkness Fellowship is November 14th. And then just a reminder that the selection of the new Harkness Fellows will occur after that time, uh, and those uh, prospective fellows who will be interviewed, that will happen in the late winter, early spring of 2017. So with that, I'd now like to hand it over to Robin Osborne, who will share with you more information about the Commonwealth Fund and the Harkness Fellowship Program. Thanks so very much, Stephen, for the wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you to all of our listeners today. We're really excited to have the chance to tell you about the Harkness Fellowships in Healthcare Policy and Practice. Um, here we go. Let me just start off with a little bit of context, tell you who we are, the Commonwealth Fund. We're one of the oldest foundations in America, established in 1918. We're an independent foundation, so we are a private, nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan foundation. And our mission is to support a high performing healthcare system. So the issues that we really worry about our access, expanding access to care, um, improving the quality of care, the patient-centeredness of care, and getting more value in the healthcare system. We're also one of the most passionate voices for uh, society's most vulnerable populations. The Commonwealth Fund is unusual amongst the 87,000 U.S. foundations in having a program that's really dedicated to international health policy and focusing on the um, high-income countries. And we're, it's really all about sparking cross-national exchange and, and learning from other countries. So just to give you a sense of the kind of work we do, um, and I think you'll hear that the, the fund's priorities are very much aligned with CFHI. So we have a lot of um, complementary issues and, and a lot of common ground in terms of the things that we work on. 
Um, needless to say, worrying about expanding access to care and insurance coverage, a good deal of our work is focused on the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, and looking at how insurance uh, coverage has expanded, um, who's covered, the affordability of that coverage, how the marketplaces are working, um, what the implications are for competition, um, the extent to which there's consolidation in the markets, and we see that on the insurance side, we see it on the provider side, big changes there. Um, the kind of uh, networks that people have access to in terms of providers, and we look at the, the um, who's not being covered. So many of you are aware that um, under the Affordable Care Act, undocumented immigrants, for example, are not allowed to buy coverage in the insurance exchanges. So there are a number of interesting, really important programs around the country to help provide coverage for them. So we track and we, we monitor and we model what's going on on the insurance side. But the other piece of the um, Affordable Care Act that doesn't get as much attention are the changes in the delivery system. And so the Affordable Care Act has tremendous opportunities to really be transformative in terms of the U.S. delivery system, both in terms of the way healthcare is organized. The U.S. has always had a very fragmented system. And through organizations such as accountable care organizations, uh, patient-centered medical homes, we're seeing a really changing landscape on the delivery side. But the payment side is another big piece of it. So the U.S., which is, has very much been built on um, uh, paying for uh, volume instead of paying for value, is now being very reoriented to paying for value. Our Secretary of Health has said that by 2018, 80% um, of what Medicare pays for will be value-based. So the fee-for-service model is really shifting over. Um, other changes, of course, have been in the insurance uh, markets themselves and the insurance industry. Um, where people previously could not get insurance if they had a, a pre-existing condition, for example. The Affordable Care Act helped uh, change all of that. So that's a, a big part of our work. We also do a lot of performance measurement. We produce report cards to look at how the U.S. healthcare system performs. I know in Canada, I'm always told there is not one Canadian healthcare system in to truth, the U.S., we, we certainly have 50 states. They're all laboratories for innovation. Um, and then, of course, we have public and private coverage. So we do report cards that, that track that performance. We look at state performance, state report cards. We look at long-term care. We look at small area variations um, to, to see how we're doing and to benchmark. Uh, U.S. performance. We do a lot of policy work in Washington in terms of um, trying to inform the debate. And, for example, we take away members of Congress every year, Republicans and Democrats, for a congressional retreat where we, it's like a boot camp, where we really try and drill members of Congress on the very complex issues that they're going to address in the next session. Um, one other thing that's special about the fund is our focus on populations. So there are two populations that we've identified. One are high-need, high-cost patients. These are the 5% of patients that actually consume about 50% of the health care uh, spending. And these are people who might be frail elderly, patients with multiple chronic conditions, patients with dementia patients who have had a very expensive episode of care, patients at the end of life, um, patients with serious mental illness, or patients that also have functional disability and require a lot of social services, community-based services, along with medical services. The other population that we look at are what we call vulnerable uh, patients, and these 
are really, we're defining basically as people who are poor, low income, uninsured, and they're disproportionately minority Americans, um, Native Americans, of course, they could be homeless patients. Um, so patients who also depend a lot on a, a very comprehensive mix of health and social care services together. And sometimes the social care services are the ones that really dominate and are even more critical to making, sh to making the health care work. Um, I think I would just suggest to, if you look at our website, you'll get uh, a really good idea of all the kinds of work that we're funding and the research that we're engaged in. Turning to the Harkness Fellowships, the Harkness Fellowships are the core of our international program in healthcare policy and practice. We think of them as the jewel in the crown. Uh, Harkness Fellowships have been around since 1925. They're the fund's longest running program. They have not always been focused on health. Just beginning in 1998, we redesigned the program so that it would really be synergistic with the fund's work and where the funds had its most expertise. Um, we have currently have eight countries that have Harkness Fellows, and many of them co-funded uh, with the country. And um, each class of fellows varies between about 12 and 16 fellows. So partners, uh, the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement, as I think you've gathered, is a critical partner for us in Canada in terms of funding the fellowship but also in providing a base for our Canadian Harkness Fellows and being key after the fellowship in helping fe fellows leverage what they've learned on the fellowship and using it to, um, to disseminate their findings, but also in terms of their career development and career trajectory. So a CFHI has been a partner for us since about 2001, I think, going back to then and has been really important in terms of establishing the Harkness Fellowship in Canada, um, encouraging and marketing the fellowship so that people know about it and understand why it's valuable to their careers and, and what they can get out of it. Um, so we're tremendously grateful to CFHI for their role in the Harkness Fellowship and also in terms of making it particularly for Canadian fellows making it very specific to Canada so that the work that Canadian fellows do here in the U.S. comes back and resonates with all of the uh, provider and policy audiences in Canada. What can Harkness Fellows expect to get to do on the fellowship? What is it all about? Well, it's about spending about 12 months in the U.S. Um, focusing on one big research issue and here's something that is really important to you. Um, the idea of coming and spending a year in the U.S., you want to take advantage of it. It's a great opportunity, and you want to pick an issue that you really care about and that's important to Canada. Uh, fellows gain an in-depth understanding of the U.S. healthcare system, but we bring the fellows together as a class throughout the year, so you really do learn about all the other healthcare systems as well. It's a chance to work with a leading U.S. policy expert and their team uh, to see firsthand what's going on in the U.S., and I have to say this is probably the most exciting time ever to come to the United States. There is so much innovation on the ground and in policy. Part of the Affordable Care Act was to establish the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which were given $10 billion to support innovation in the delivery system, innovative models of care, and innovative payment mechanisms for care. So it's really an extraordinary time to look at innovation. Um, fellows can enhance their methodological skills if you've always worked with large data sets, it's a, maybe a good chance to sort of go outside your comfort zone and do some qualitative work or mixed methods. And I think the most important thing that comes out of fellowship, the chance to develop networks of contacts, people that you would meet throughout the year that will be available to you and, and 
um, part of your career and your life going forward for ongoing collaboration. What fellows always say to me is that the, the best part of the fellowship is that it's a chance to step away from the day-to-day -day demands of their job and really think big and reflect and recharge. Um, the fund is very hands-on with the, uh, the fellows. We call ourselves the Value Added Foundation. Um, our staff, we have a staff of about 60 here at the Commonwealth Fund. Half of them are nationally recognized experts in their fields. All are available to the Harkness Fellows. We connect fellows to our grantees. And fellows become part of the Commonwealth Fund family and can use our name uh, liberally uh, to open any doors and meet any people that they really want to meet over the course of the year. Uh, I won't say too much about the, the uh, budget that's available on the website, but the basic fellowship award is $130,000. That includes a living allowance, but it also includes round-trip airfare, um, project-related travel, travel to all the conferences that we do, uh, health insurance, U.S. federal state taxes. Fellows coming with families, we said that's about $60,000 for a partner and for two children up to the age of 18. Um, we're very family friendly. If you happen to have a third child, we won't make you leave them at home. We'll actually cover them as well. They can come too, so don't worry about that. Um, these are ideas of projects, and these are real projects. So these are the kinds of things that last year's fellows and this, year fel this year's fellows have been working on. And you can see from the, the diversity of projects, the wide range of opportunities that fellows have in terms of topics. Um, and I think certainly all of the topics that Stephen mentioned would be incredibly uh, interesting and useful to look at on a Harkness Fellowship. And this gives you an idea of some of the, the specific things that fellows are doing from uh, looking at integration of mental health and primary care to bundled payments um, are uh, under the Affordable Care Act. We have a lot of demonstration projects going on around bundled payments, where there's a single payment to a provider for care that begins, let's say, for joint replacement and diagnosis through hospital care and surgery to aftercare, rehab, physical therapy. Um, looking at issues around performance feedback, looking at uh, multidisciplinary teams. There's a lot of work that uh, is going on here in that area as well. Placements. Fellows and applicants always are, are, that's probably the number one question. And all of these things that I'm, I'm rushing through very quickly to get through, cover a lot of ground, please ask questions, feel free to ask questions about projects, placements, who should apply. Um, we'll have time afterwards. But placements, um, this is maybe the most important point that this leads to. Um, Harkness Fellows are placed in academic centers. They're placed, you can see these are very typical placements. They're placed in integrated delivery systems. Some fellows at the Institute of Healthcare Improvement is a great placement. Uh, with government agencies, we've had fellows at the Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. Um, one of the things that is most important about the fellowship is it's, two, it's a two-way exchange for learning. And fellows come to the U.S. to learn about everything that's going on here. But for us, it's a tremendous opportunity because we get to learn about your healthcare system, to learn about the Canadian healthcare systems, and all of the expertise that you bring with you. So when we um, place fellows, the mentors and the placements are so excited to have a Harkness Fellow because for them, they get to learn from you. You look at the U.S. healthcare system certainly through a different lens, but you bring this tremendous knowledge and expertise about your own healthcare system, which we learn from. So here you'll see some of the um, mentors that we've had over the years. And you can see that many of them have been mentors 
you know, four, five, six times over because they really love having Harkness Fellows and they love what fellows bring to their department and to their team. Um, fellows don't need to have a mentor lined up when applying. It's, it's great. There's a place in the application. If you know who you'd like to work with, please let us know. But once fellows are selected, we spend about three months, believe it or not, working really intensively with the fellow, the new fellow, on the project. If the project isn't quite right, helping to reshape it, that's no problem. The uh, application calls it a preliminary proposal, so we expect that we'll need to work with you to help you make it more relevant to the U.S., but also on figuring out who is the perfect mentor. And if you, you may have ideas, we want to hear them, but we'll also give you four or five or six experts to contact and talk to them and find out what they're working on, if, you, if that would be a good fit with your project, uh, what data they have. And then at the end of that time, we, you know, we talk and, and basically you're going to tell us who you'd love to work with and who you think is the best fit. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of collaborative process and um, it's really important to get it right and we work with you really closely on that and support you. Once selected, Fellows um, have to spend most of their time tying up what they're doing in their home country and getting ready to come over. And when fellows arrive, fellows arrive in August or beginning of September. And over the course of the year, we bring fellows together about seven times. So there's a lot of bonding. And the first time is an orientation. We just had one two weeks ago here in New York. Uh, fellows spend a week in New York at the fund meeting all of the fund senior staff who present to them. Fellows mentors come in for a day. Fellows get to know each other. They learn about each other's projects and um, also about uh, fellows' uh, home country healthcare systems. We do site visits. This year we went, for example, to Montefiore in the Bronx, which is one of our pioneer ACOs. In October, fellows get together again, this time for a qualitative methods workshop. Uh, we bring in two really outstanding qualitative researchers to teach this, and it's very geared to the fellows' individual projects to help support the projects, as well as give, for fellows who haven't done qualitative methods, give them some very basic understanding. And then these researchers are available to fellows throughout the year to uh, be consultants on their projects and the qualitative methods if they're not that experienced in doing them. So let's come to our international symposium in Washington. It's a two and a half day meeting that brings together health ministers, senior government officials from the 11 core countries that are part of our international program. And it's focused around a theme. Last year was around bending the cost curve. The year before was on high need, high cost patients. This year is on big data. Um, and fellows get to spend some time with their own health minister and their senior government officials. Um, in particular, they have a breakfast where they really get to talk to them um, and share what they're, they're here to learn in the US, but also find out what's on the minister's mind. What are they most interested? We go to the IHI in Boston in um, February and spend a day learning. They are world-class leaders in quality improvement, improvement science, and we learn about the major uh, projects they have underway and the sort of techniques that they use for learning um, and for dissemination. So that's always pretty exciting and I think um, very closely aligned and parallel with a lot of the work that CFHI does. Washington is a Washington policy briefing. We call it Inside the Beltway. Look at Washington. We meet with stakeholders. We meet with members of Congress. We meet with the heads of all of the government agencies in health. Um, we meet with the Assistant Secretary for Health, the Director of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI. Uh, we also meet with um, interest groups and lobbyists the head of America's Health Insurance Plans will meet with uh, pharmaceutical 
uh, companies will meet with journalists as well, Washington Post journalists or, or from Vox, uh, for example, or Politico, um, and really try and get a sense of what are the dynamics in Washington. Um, why do we have so much gridlock? What's on the agenda of each of these stakeholders in, in the coming year? This is always pretty interesting because it's, uh, we get some pretty divergent viewpoints. We are now doing site visit to California because states are so important in terms of health reform. Uh, this past year we were in uh, Los Angeles. We went to Kaiser Permanente. We also spent time with the um, uh, Commissioner of Health for uh, Los Angeles County and learned a lot about their programs, uh, particularly that dealt with homeless people. Los Angeles has the highest homeless population of any city in America. Then we went uh, north to Sacramento. We met with the Secretary of Health for California. We also spent a day in Silicon Valley at Google and at some of the healthcare startups to, to learn about some of the unbelievable things that are coming down uh, the pipeline. We do leadership dinners throughout the year. These are very informal dinners with some of the most influential people in healthcare, uh, not only U.S., but sometimes from other healthcare systems. Um, you can see names, famous names like Don Berwick, um, Karen Davis, Mark McClellan, uh, Secretary Zeltner, who was um, health minister in Switzerland for 19 years. We, we've also uh, met with uh, uh, Dr. Julio Frank, who is Health Minister of Mexico. Um, and these are chances really to find out what they think you need to know to be, be a leader in healthcare and really have an impact. And they really talk very personally about their experience, a very off-the-record, informal conversations. Um, there is a little bit of work involved with all of this. This is all the fun part I've been telling you. But we um, also ask and that the fellows produce a, a product at the end of the fellowship based on their research, which is typically a peer-reviewed journal article. And here you can see some great examples of work that fellows have done in the last two, three years. Um, for fellows who are not academic researchers, don't have that background, maybe work in government at a senior level, a policy report, a white paper for their health minister and senior government officials would also be appropriate. Most fellows, by the way, produce more than one uh, product from their fellowship. Many fellows produce two and three and four papers from their fellowship. Um, we bring fellows back together every three or four years for alumni events. So the fellowship certainly is not a one-year experience. We're engaged with fellows, uh, hopefully for the rest of their careers. Sometimes invite fellows to be speakers, like at the International Symposium, give grants to fellows. Um, fellows Canadian Steve Morgan from UBC now has two grants from us at this time looking at pharmaceutical policy and pharmaceutical costs. Um, so we hope that the fellowship is just the beginning of your relationship with the Commonwealth Fund. And um, here's just uh, there's more of this. We did a review of the Harkness Fellowship. Uh, a few years ago looking at 10 classes of fellows. And I think the key points were that five and 10 years out of the fellowship, Harkness Fellows were still the vast majority collaborating with their mentors, other colleagues in the US, and other Harkness Fellows from other countries in other years. And over 90% said it was very valuable experience uh, for their careers. Um, Here's just, uh, you can find more information on, on our website, but here's just a, a quote from one of our fellows who came with a family. More than half of the fellows each year come with families, and I think Al can talk to that uh, personally. It sounds pretty um, intimidating to move your whole family to the U.S. for the year. Um, it turns out to be just a great adventure. Fellows, almost all of them, have really outstanding, exciting, wonderful, happy family experiences that kids grow a lot. Um, 
so just to, as reassurance, I would say we have a lot of fellows who have come with families, and if you're interested in applying and you want to talk to any of them, I'm sure they could share what the experience was like with you. Uh, who should apply? Uh, this is just the sort of technical expectations, but it's really anyone who really wants to make a difference and has a passion for healthcare, improving healthcare, and improving healthcare policy. Uh, deadline, November 14th. Information on our website, please look at that. We have frequently asked questions. We also have some themes for uh, suggested projects. We also have uh, d a whole list of data sources that are available. And we also have information about all of the former fellows, over 200, with their contact information. So you should feel free to also contact them, as well as Stephen, I know, is always available to answer questions. And I am, too, very happy to talk to interested uh, fellows. So I'm going to uh, turn over now to Ale, who uh, was a fellow last year, one of our two Canadian fellows last year, and just uh, had an outstanding fellowship and did really impressive work. Thank, thank you, you so uh, Robin, and thank you, Stephen, for the opportunity to speak uh, with prospective applicants for the fellowship this year. I'm going to take um, the next 10 minutes or so to give you a short snapshot of my personal experience as a Harkness Fellow. As Robin alluded to, I'm a very recent alumnus, having just completed my fellowship this past August, so my reflections, uh, for better or worse, are relatively fresh. Uh, by way of background, I'm a pediatrician in a large children's hospital in Toronto. I'm about 10 years out from the end of my own clinical training. Uh, I spent the beginning of my own career mainly seeing patients and also worked to develop a structured complex care program within my hospital. And then in more recent years, I started to get really interested in health services research, especially related to delivery of care to individuals with complex chronic conditions, as well as a variety of different issues in maternal child health. I reclassified my own appointment in my academic center to a clinician scientist and started developing affiliations with various research networks locally, nationally, uh, and beyond to begin to, begin, uh, to build a research program that was closely affiliated uh, with policymakers, especially in my own province in Ontario. And then in the end of the summer, last summer, I got an email from the chair of my department, basically forwarded me an email he had received about the Harkness Fellowship and asked if I'd consider applying. At the time, I, uh, I knew a little bit about the Commonwealth Fund because they published these wonderful international reports, uh, and I knew a little bit about CFHI, but not a ton. Uh, but was really intrigued by the idea. I was at a transitional period in my own career, having just um, begun to develop a, uh, a more research-focused career and a more policy and health services-focused career, and thought this might be a great opportunity to develop some new ideas and some new collaborations. Uh, on a personal level, my wife um, was between jobs. Our kids were in elementary school. I have three children, um, age 12, 10, and 8. Uh, so they were still in a developmental phase where a move would not be very traumatic for them. I think this would be very different if my kids were in high school. I spoke to as many alumni as I could find, made a lot of cold calls, sent a lot of cold emails. Uh, and what I found out quickly, uh, basically without exception, was that everyone I reached out to expressed this recollection of our experience as a Harkness Fellow is something that was transformative. That was a word I heard multiple times. Uh, so I decided to throw my hat into the ring. I wrote a proposal, went through a bit of a nerve-wracking interview, and, and somehow miraculously, as my wife reminds me, I was chosen as one of the two Canadian Fellows in my year. The other one being O'Neill Bhattacharya, who is a family physician at Women's College Hospital, uh, also in Toronto. I spent the year mainly studying the effects of the Affordable Care Act on maternal and child health, and in particular, focused my work on some recent policy efforts uh, in the U.S. on children with complex health care needs. Uh, after selection, the most stressful part for me was deciding what to work on and where to do it, and the fund was extraordinarily supportive of this. 
Uh, one thing you quickly learn um, is that Robin has connections with virtually every major leader in American healthcare. She's, she's like a healthcare Rolodex. Uh, and she also has this incredible knack for matchmaking uh, and, and great insight into who, what really is the best fit for a mentor and a mentee. I ended up going to Stanford University and had two excellent co-mentors. Most of the fellows in my year ended up on the East Coast, uh, but there were four fellows who went uh, to the Bay Area. For me, this choice was really uh, based on having, um, having an experience that was unique compared with my normal work environment. Coming from a large public university in Toronto, a city that sometimes feels uh, and looks quite similar to other American cities in the Northeast, um, coming from Canada, a country that we often bemoan our inability to innovate, uh, not just in healthcare but in other sectors as well, there was something very attractive uh, beyond the scenery in this picture that I'm about to put up of me and my family about going to spend a year in Silicon Valley and at Stanford. Uh, many fellows work on a single project over the course of the year. I ended up getting pulled into an embarrassment of riches at my placement and worked on a number of interrelated projects, although all of them were focused on either uh, maternal or child health, uh, care and policy, and or chronic complex care. The other amazing thing, I think Robin alluded to this a little bit about the fellowship, is the opportunity to network. I've been told this by previous fellows as well, but really didn't appreciate it until I was actually in the, in the fellowship. There's something about the Harkness business card, the mentors you're set up with, the locations in which you're placed, which makes it so easy to meet and learn from incredible uh, people, uh, and really, really was an outstanding opportunity. So what did I learn from the experience? In many ways, uh, our two healthcare systems differ a lot, and I spent a lot of the year thinking about this and reflecting on it, and collected uh, some pictures on my iPhone uh, that, that I, I still look at it sometimes um, and, and add to these reflections. So I want to show you a few snapshots I took over the year that I think encompass some of the ones that I found in many ways rather surreal. So uh, the first one is about the wealth of direct-to-consumer advertising in the U.S. Um, we'll never see an ad like this, I think, in Canada where an emergency room is uh, encouraging people to use uh, their facility for primary care, and that may make some people cringe. But on the other side, um, you notice in the U.S. a lot more access for consumers in, in many ways. Uh, for instance, access to their own electronic health records, something that we are uh, fairly poor at in Canada is, is much better in the United States. Uh, here's another one. Um, this one is focused on what I call the hotel-like qualities of many hospitals, at least for privately insured patients in the United States. This is a children's hospital at Stanford that offers free valet parking. On first look, this seems a bit ridiculous, but then uh, when you consider the egregious cost of parking in Canadian hospitals, and this has actually been a, an issue that's made it to the front page of, of papers in this country, uh, maybe it isn't. And when you really think deeply about it, uh, and about the needs of the type of people who use hospital, the infirm, the disabled, um, or in the case of this particular photo, the immunocompromised, maybe there is some value in, 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 in considering improving something that may seem mundane, like the parking experience um, uh, for, for the type of patients we serve. I think as Canadians, we take great pride in our health care, and without a doubt, on a population level, I think we do better than the American system. Uh, if we provide more care to more people at, um, with better outcomes at lower cost overall. But I was really, really struck during my year by some sobering observations that made me feel a little less smug than, 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 than when I started the year. First, there are pockets of healthcare delivery, like certain integrated healthcare organizations and aspects of healthcare delivery, like electronic healthcare records, where we lag behind the U.S. Second, and probably I think most important, the pace of change in the U.S. is dizzying. During the year, uh, as Robin alluded to, you really, really get immersed into American healthcare policy. And with regards to healthcare delivery, there really is a lot to be learned. Accountable care organizations, uh, innovation centers, the, the, the infiltration of the language of value into discourse in healthcare, not just amongst policymakers, but even on the level of providers and I can go on and on. 
And I think the learnings and crosstalk with what is going on here in Canada, um, uh, it, uh, as Stephen alluded to, is huge. So like this cartoon here in this slide, as a Harkness Fellow, you can really get to feel like a migrating Canadian goose perched on a window, observing and learning uh, from all the incredible things going on in the U.S. In many ways, it is a bit like hockey, always exciting, frequently adversarial, uh, but fortunately uh, a little less violent. And the really, really cool thing about the Harkness here is you also get exposed via your co-fellows to multiple other healthcare systems. So whether your, your project is focused on um, on, on international health beyond the United States or not, you really do get immersed in international comparative healthcare policy. It's actually pretty amazing how many of us actually started to work together on things during the year and continuing to work on them even after the year has ended. And uh, as Robin mentioned before, lots of fellows have continued to carry out uh, work uh, in collaboration with the Commonwealth Fund. For me personally, I recently submitted my uh, final report to the fund and beyond the traditional academic metrics of success in terms of papers published and whatnot, what I really was most grateful for for the year was the opportunity to develop new collaborations and, uh, and think big about new projects that I'm going to continue to work on. So with all that, I'd like to offer a few pieces of advice since, I ha since I'm standing on, um, on my soapbox here as you go through the application process. Probably the most important one for those of you uh, with partners and families is please contemplate the effect of the year on your family. My family was on board. It took some work, but they were. But if they weren't, uh, I, the year would not have been a success. The fund was incredibly supportive with, in terms of the logistics of the move. But, you know, all that being said, even just crossing the border from Canada, it, it's still very stressful. Uh, and uh, I couldn't have done it without my family's support. Number two, be prepared for a lot of travel. About, uh, about once a month um, or so, the, the fellows all get together for a seminar of some sorts. These are incredible opportunities to learn so much and meet some of the really outstanding leaders in healthcare in the United States. This is a picture, um, uh, one of the best ones, Robin mentioned it before, which is the visit to Washington, D.C. for the National Policy Briefing. Uh, we happened to be there when Justin Trudeau was vid visiting the White House for the very first time, hence this picture of me and O'Neill, the other Canadian fellow, uh, with both our country's flags outside the White House. During that visit, we met Nancy Lehman. This is just one of the many, many, many people you meet over the course of the year. And Robin, correct me if I'm wrong, I think she's now the Executive Vice President of ARP, the American Association of Retired People, which I think has over 37 million members. That number still blows me away. It is an incredibly con important constituency for healthcare, a major presence on Capitol Hill, and it serves more members than the number of people who live in Canada. And the fund organizes these incredible visits, and you really do get to meet many of the most influential thinkers and leaders in healthcare in the U.S. from all perspectives, the political elements, the insurance system, both public and private, the providers, industry, pharmacy, etc. And on top of this travel, many fellows um, have projects that necessitate a lot of travel for site visits. And again, that's a wonderful opportunity. But when you're constructing your projects, please, those of you who have families, keep in mind that the family, the family time is, is, is critical and lots of travel does add up. For choosing your project, I would recommend spending some time on the Commonwealth uh, Fund's website and probably CFHI's website as well both of which are very, very comprehensive. Think about what are the relevant policy issues that are important to both organizations. Think about what other fellows have done in the past, who they have worked with, where they have their placement. This isn't to say you can't choose something totally new, and, 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 and you should. You should do something original for the topic of your research, but I think uh, this might give you some guidance on the kind of things you can accomplish in a year, the types of projects that would be a good fit for the, um, for, for the strategic directions of uh, CFHI uh, and the Commonwealth Fund and the types of mentors and placements that are appropriate. One thing I was advised, and I will pass on this advice because I agree completely with it, is please consider doing something slightly out of your comfort zone, a new method, a new topic, a new type of collaboration. 
For me, this was the one year where I was able to get away from my daily job and its pressures, uh, which for me are related to patient care, administration, and teaching uh, primarily. I got to work with disciplines that I'd never had much collaboration with in the past, health economists, psychologists, physicians from specialties outside of my own. For you, it might be something totally different. What was really cool and really fun was I was able to, with, to work on what I would call classic research projects, but also to play a role in different types of work. My, one of my co-mentors ran a healthcare innovation shop that recruits fellows from multiple disciplines to develop, pilot, and implement systematic changes in the healthcare system focused on high-value care. And I got to work really closely with that team over the year on health system design work relevant to my interests. Um, and that was some, a spectacular opportunity uh, during my year. So, so that's on one leg, I think, my summary of the Harkness year and my experience with the Harkness process. I'm not sure I've done justice to how wonderful it is, how incredibly thankful I am for the opportunity. I don't know by what dumb luck I was fortunate enough to be chosen, but the group of colleagues I got to know during the year was absolutely fantastic, and they really do become like a second family. I'm actually contemplating going to England to, visiting, to visit one of them over the Christmas holidays. Um, what we, ha we have a little WhatsApp group of my year's fellow. We have daily postings reflecting the, the dysphoria we have of coming back to, um, uh, to our regular jobs for many of us and, and um, the fact that the year, of, uh, the year has ended. But um, we are, will continue uh, to, to be together, and I, I think forever. It was really, really, truly a fantastic experience. And I'll leave you um, with a slide uh, of one of my non-work highlights of the year, which was the opportunity to do the Great American Road Trip. Uh, my family and I drove back uh, from California to Toronto over two and a half weeks. Um, I hope you all apply or consider applying, and if you have any questions, my email address is here. Uh, please do not hesitate to contact me. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, both Robin and I, for uh, a great presentation this afternoon. Um, both, you know, for both to both of you for really highlighting the diversity of experiences across the U.S. that come uh, as part of uh, membership in the Commonwealth Funds fellow, Harkness Fellowship. Um, the quality of the networking and contacts that are made throughout the time that you're there, uh, and the access to the renowned mentors and coaches uh, that the, the fund actually has at its disposal. Um, and I'll thanks for the reflections on your personal and professional experience of the fellowship and how that fellowship actually uh, has really informed your own perspective and practice uh, as after you came back to Canada. Um, at this time, we do have a few minutes, not a, a lot of time, but we have a few minutes for questions. If there's anyone who would like to ask a question now, uh, please uh, put it in the chat box and we will, uh, we will um, I think I see someone typing, but I don't see a question yet. Um, I guess one question I would have in the, in the interim for both, either of you is if someone is sitting there right now kind of on the fence about whether they apply or not for the fellowship, um, what would be one of the, the kind of the one thing you think they should really be thinking about or focusing on or, or um, uh, really pay attention to in terms of whether or not they should actually take the time to submit that application? Eil, can you just give people some advice on that? Uh, so, uh, you know, my, my, my reflex reaction is apply, it's amazing. Um, <laughs> or nuanced answer is if you are at a life stage, both professionally and personally, where you um, have the ability to do this and have an interest in a professional level of, of, of moving into a larger leadership role and playing a larger role in shaping Canadian healthcare policy and practice, 100% uh, apply. The, I, I think I said in my presentation a little bit, if there are family or personal issues with spending a year in the U.S. and the transition is just really, really, really challenging, that would be my only, only reservation for, for, for people applying. Thanks. And Robin, anything that you would add to that? I think um, one thing is probably worth saying, and this goes across countries, I always try to make this point, um, it is competitive, and you can see the caliber, high caliber of the fellows, but it's also, there's also a very, you know, the odds are good. 
with the Harkness Fellowship because we don't get thousands of applications in any country. Um, but the simple reason that it takes that people have to want to be qualified, but there's a window of opportunity when people can apply. And as uh, Al and, and Stephen were saying, you know, when it's right for the family, right point in your career. So, the, you know, the chances of applying are actually, you know, far better than we normally apply in most cases for, you know, a, a grant or something. So, I, you know, I, I don't be deterred by the fact that it, it looks like it might be, you know, so hard on so many people because the, the odds are good and it's, we get a small pool of applicants every year. So there's a, a good chance of being shortlisted for interview as well. So it, it's Thank worth you, a chance. Exactly. Uh, thanks for that, Robin. I think you know it's not like applying to the CIHR for a grant where there are hundreds of applications coming in because again, it's a very, uh, very specific and kind of particular context, and and there are a limited number of people in the country who can do that. There was a question here on, you know, what was the success rate for last year, and I would say, generally speaking, what is the success rate? I mean, I, generally we get, uh, you know, anywhere from you know, five to ten or so applications, um, more more like ten or so. Uh, so the success rate is pretty good. Another question here, how often do non-traditional applicants succeed, e.g., educational leaders who are not researchers? Robin, could you talk about that? I think <clears throat> we get, we have applicants who, and fellows who don't come from a research background, maybe work at the Ministry of Health or journalists, for example, um, or work in the delivery system, people who are leaders in the delivery system. So I think the uh, key thing for people who don't come from a more traditional re health services research background, and that's fine, that's great, because we're interested in all of those other people too, is the one thing you do have to demonstrate is you have the skills to do a research project. So, I mean, of course, one has support. There's a mentor and there are other people, you know, in the, uh, in the team that you'd be part of. But you basically would need to demonstrate in, in the application that you've done analysis, policy analysis, that you've done work that um, is the equivalent to doing uh, a research project. So that's an important thing, I think, to, to just say. Um, and I think the research proposal itself should reflect the fact of you know, your, your ability to put together a project with you know, good research questions and methodology that shows that you've thought it through. So I think one doesn't have to be a, a researcher trained that way and, and working in that context, but you do need to have the skills to do the research project. And many Great. very successful fellows have come from backgrounds that are, that include being, you know, the uh, director of a district health board, for example, in New Zealand, or being in the minister's uh, strategy unit in the UK, in the NHS, um, and have, you know, been very successful in doing a Harkness Fellowship. Right. Thank you. And there was a question here as well just about the, uh, the ratio of applications to fellowships. Uh, is that similar in other countries? compared to Canada, is Canada an outlier in the uh, number of applicants we get versus? No, I think pretty similar. Pretty okay. Similar. So we just pretty have similar around. in the New Zealand applications, um, and I think we have uh, nine applications for one position. Right. So it's very comparable. Yep. Great. So just a reminder for all of you who may have questions who, that come up after this, you have our contact information. Uh, both my and Robin's information if you have anything uh, that you would like to ask us about the, um, the process of applying and the priorities for applying. And uh, also Elle's um, 
email for any of you who would like to contact him, as he said, just to get a sense of uh, some of the experience that he had when he was there, questions around what it's actually like uh, for the fellows and their family members to be there. So I think I'll close it off now by saying thank you so much to both of you for great uh, presentations this afternoon. Uh, we'd also ask those of you to uh, join us again in the near future. Sign up for our newsletter to keep an eye on your email for a full listing of upcoming webinars, including reminders of uh, the closing of the uh, deadline to apply for the fellowship, which is in November. Um, as a res registered participant in today's session, you will receive an email in the next few days directing you to the full recording of today's session on our website. There are also, as you heard, a number of resources available on both the CFHI and the Commonwealth Fund websites with more information about the call for applications. And we do hope that uh, many of you on the line today will consider applying for the fellowship. We've just launched our live poll now, and your feedback is invaluable to us for future webinar design. So please take a minute to uh, provide us with some feedback on today's session. While you're filling that in, and we really appreciate that you do, uh, once again, I'd just like to thank Robin and I for their excellent presentations, to Kelly and Sheena for working behind the scenes to make the webinar happen, and of course to you uh, for joining us today and for considering applying to the Harkness Fellowship. This concludes today's webinar. Everybody have a great day. Thank you.